sports. The WNBA has been held as a model for how to conduct a season safely during the pandemic. Like the NBA, the WNBA didn't see a single COVID outbreak during those 97 days players spent inside the playoff bubble. So what will the upcoming upcoming season bring? Let's bring in WNBA Commissioner Kathy Engelbert. Kathy, it's great to talk to you. Uh, the WNBA has not set a start date yet. You're several months out from your usual start of the season. How are you juggling the, the health and safety protocols right now as you think about how you want to conduct this season? Yeah, it's a great question. It's great to be here. You know, we're excited. This is going to be our 25th uh, season, first women's professional sports league in the U.S. to reach 25 years. So it's a big milestone we'll be celebrating. Um, and, you know, we've been working on a variety of scenario plans since we came out of our bubble last October. Uh, and similar to, you know, observing other sports, what's working, what's not. Our base cases currently working with teams to play in our arenas. Um, and we've had an amazing off season because our collective bargaining agreement from last year set up free agency. So we've got a lot of exciting players who have moved teams like Candace Parker, who was the number one overall pick in 2008 for the L.A. Sparks, is now on the Chicago Sky. And, you know, we, we've had a lot of movement. So we're really excited to tip off. We're, 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 tip, we're summer sport May through regular season, May through September, and then we'll go into playoffs. So we're hoping, you know, that we'll have that footprint this year. Kathy, the last time you and I spoke, it was right before the 2020 season kicked off inside that bubble. And you pointed out that this was an opportunity for the WNBA because you were going to get a chance to be televised more than what typically happened during a season. Talk to us just about that opportunity and what you think that did for the league's growth going forward. Well, and, th and think what I probably didn't know back then is how existential it would have been to be out of the sports landscape for 20 months. Uh, which is what it would have been if we didn't try to put on a season last year. So once we followed the science, got the health and safety protocols in place, um, you know, we were really fortunate to have ESPN as such a great partner and cover us. Um, you know, our average viewership was up over 60%. Our, and, and it was a very crowded sports landscape. And we had, I think you're showing, you're showing it now, the 34% increase in viewership for our finals game three, which by the way, was on a Tuesday night uh, against some major men's professional sports. So um, and our social media followers increased 73%. So we had 38 million unique viewers uh, watch our game uh, last season. So we had our best-selling merchandise item of all time in the orange hoodie, the classic orange hoodie. So a lot of momentum uh, for the upcoming season. And, um, you know, we I never thought last year going into this pandemic, we'd be where we are today, but really excited to be tipping off that 25th season coming up. Kathy, I wonder if we can talk a bit more about the business side of things. You just mentioned the viewership, uh, how how significantly it increased last year. Uh, that's pretty rare at a time when we were talking about uh, the decline in ratings for major men's uh, sports. And I wonder, as you look ahead to renegotiating the TV deal with ESPN, whether you think you have a little more leverage here, given the increased popularity of the league. Well, I mean, there's a moment and momentum around women and women in sports and women in society and women of color, of which obviously our league is one of the most diverse league in sports, too. So, um, you know, I was hired to come into the league to drive the economic model uh, after a, a long career in business. So, you know, we've developed a five year business transformation plan and it'll be driven by the things that drive media and sponsors and partners to, you know, step up and want to put. Uh, money into women's sports. So, um, you know, consumption and engagement, fan engagement. I mean, we innovated around a, uh, a second screen experience uh, coming off of last season where we had no fans in our seats. But what did we do? We took the opportunity of a crisis to innovate. And you have to do that in the middle of a crisis. And um, and so, yeah, the breadth of coverage is, is great, um, driving more viewers. But this is about the players. This is about building household names, storytelling around. I mean, these are the best athletes in the world um, and, and just storytelling around that and, and fixing kind of the valuation model. I, I, you know, so reflected on how women are valued in society in general. And then you come to women's sports and how discounted that valuation model is and having had a long business career on valuation and algorithms, um, which you guys can appreciate. We've, we've got to drive a different way of looking at valuing women and women's sports.
And Kathy, we certainly do. And I want to talk a little bit more about gender equality because you specifically have broken through almost every glass ceiling, really rising through the ranks at Deloitte, becoming the first U.S. CEO of a big four firm, now as commissioner of WNBA. What's the number one priority that you hope to achieve when it comes to leveling that playing field, aside from just, uh, aside from just the pay that the athletes receive? Yeah, it, it's a great question. And thank you for asking it because this isn't, about necessarily comparing ourselves to the major premier professional men's sports. This is about lifting all of women and women's sports. These are working women. Some of them are working moms. They're entrepreneurs. Uh, we tripled the pay of the top players in our, our most recent uh, collective bargaining agreement, but we also gave them a holistic package of family benefits, of fertility benefits, of better travel, you know, better everything. So I, I'm really proud of that, but we still have a lot of work to do to drive, again, partners and media partners in to, to essentially cover the WNBA and these players and their stories. And, you know, I'm a big studier of the men's leagues and how they've built these household names that everyone recognizes. And I think if we can get the Sue Birds and Diana Taurasi's and Neka Ogumake's and Liz Cambage and, and all the great players and Sabrina Ionescu, who came in as a rookie last year and got hurt, but she'll be back this year. And get them to be, you know, more well-known and more exposure. And that's what it's all about because that drives eyes on your game and that drives the valuation model. Kathy, as much as COVID-19 has dominated the headlines over the last year, WNBA players were really uh, critical in getting the Black Lives Matter movement going last year. Um, certainly a, a lot of messaging on the court, off the court as well. The NBA made the decision, at least in this season, to really scale back some of that messaging. How are you thinking about how prominently that should play in the upcoming season? Yeah, for the viewers that don't know, the, the WNBA players made it much bigger than basketball last season, uh, amplifying the Black Lives Matter movement and the Say Her Name campaign. They wanted to do something around female victims of police brutality. And um, and so we launched the WNBA Justice Movement and the Social Justice Council, which has been incredible advocates for change and real impact. And these these women have, have just been at the forefront of this for so long that it was natural for them to step up and the power of civic engagement and them all being together, a whole league in one place. So that was not one and done. I assure you, we're going to double down on that for the, for the 2021 season. Um, we've got some great storylines out there with um, some of our players who opted out for their social justice platform coming back now stronger to play. Uh, Renee Montgomery just retired and now became an owner of one of our franchises and, and really opted out last year to focus on social justice issues and to find what she wanted to do next. So, um, you know, we're, we're definitely going to be doubling down on that. And you'll see more about the social justice efforts of the players uh, this season. Kathy, talking about the future of the league, one of the changes this year will be that players need to opt in for the draft. This is different than what has happened in years past. Why did this change? And I guess, did COVID have anything to do with this new mandate? So if you, um, our draft is coming up uh, in a, a little uh, over over a month um, and April 15th. So we're really looking forward to it. And the reason why we had to have a more kind of uh, time-driven process this year is the NCAA gave an extra, because of COVID and not knowing when the NCAA would have a successful women's basketball season, they have. There's been some bumps and rocks that like everybody else has had, but they, they've they had. Um, but because they didn't know that, they gave an extra year of eligibility to every senior, even if they had already played four years. So in order to determine who's going to enter the WNBA draft, um, we actually have to have them opt in because even if you're a senior, you could play another year. So it's not um, driven by us, it's driven by by the process of, uh, and but it was the pandemic that caused to give that extra year of eligibility. So we're looking forward to seeing which uh, NCAA players, and we have some international players as well that uh, hopefully will be opting into our draft this year. Kathy Engelberg, Commissioner of the WNBA, thanks so much for taking the time to jump on here and join us today.